Washed in the blood of the Lamb Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood In the soul-winning blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? On the last Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul winning blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Good singing. Now turn over to 693. Number 693, a shelter in the time of storm. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. One second. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears, alarm, no foes to fight, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. On the last, oh, rock divine, oh, dear, a shelter in the time of storm, no thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Remain standing. Amen. It's good to see you here this evening, and uh, I'm glad you came back, and hope you had a restful, uh, restful afternoon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to uh, be with our service tonight. Lord, we do thank you so much for all the many blessings that you provided for us and provided for this church, and just uh, so many things. And uh, Lord, we do pray that you'll meet with us tonight. Help us for this uh, next brief time help us to be able to lay the concerns and things that are in our lives in our minds help us to lay those aside for a little while while we look in your word and i pray lord that um, whatever may be uh, on our hearts and minds that lord that you would uh, answer those things according to your will and give grace where grace is needed as well thank you again lord for all that have been able to come bless those that weren't able and i pray that you'll bless those that uh, uh, maybe watching on uh, uh, the Facebook and all of that kind of thing. And I pray, Lord, you speak to our hearts tonight and give us something that we can go out with, uh, better able to serve you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. You may be seated. Well, let me give you just a few announcements. Um, there's not really that many. They're in your bulletin, but I um, do want to continue to pray for our missionaries. Uh, the missionaries of the week are the Atlantic uh, Independent Baptist Fellowship, and it's basically they are church planners. And then um, also every third Sunday, so it will be next week, uh, the MCEF donations uh, to be make sure we get those and uh, bring the donations 
uh, to the MSEF bin that's on the table in the foyer there. And, uh, and you can look in your bulletin what you need, what you can bring, bring non-perishable foods and hygiene supplies. So uh, we appreciate all that you can do there. Thursday evening on the 20th, we're going to have Maranatha, uh, I'm, is that right, Maranatha? West Coast Baptist College, okay. West Coast Baptist College uh, will be with us and um, they'll take the service. So we're not having a Wednesday night service before that, but the Thursday night. Um, the Wednesday night's on the 19th, so the 20th is when we'll have that. And there's an ice cream social afterwards that all the youth are welcome to go to. And, and the pastor had given an age group, um, and I can't remember what the lowest is. Um, was it sixth grade, something like that? Um, sixth grade on up through high school graduation, that kind of a thing. And um, he didn't he didn't mention this, but he has in the past that if any of you adults want to go, you're more than welcome to go, but uh, you'll have to pay for your own. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll just put that out there. And if he changes it, that's great. I'll be going. Now, uh, then uh, we also have Chloe um, Freeman. Freener. Fleener. Okay. So I told Margaret earlier, I said, the fancy writing, I can't read. You know, it's in the bulletin, it's all fancy font. But uh, that baby shower is on the uh, 22nd, and that begins at 10 a.m. All you ladies are invited to that. I hope you'll be able to attend uh, that as well. All right. Um, and then the patriotic service, the pastor mentioned this morning, and the picnic social right after that. And that'll be on the 30th. And uh, he has a special day planned for that. And that's the, uh, those have always been really good. And I hope you're able to attend that as well. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. And as they come, um, I don't see any visitors, but if, again, I can only see a certain distance. So uh, I, can, I can tell if people are there, but I can't tell who it is. Um, but uh, if you're here and you're visiting, we do uh, welcome you and thank you for coming. Uh, but we're going to take up our offering now. And Brother John, can you? Pray for us. Let's stand once again and turn in your hymnals to number 340. This will be a chorus for tonight. 
number 340, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We'll sing it through once and then meet each other. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful grace, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn around and greet each other. Right, as we return to our seats, let's go through one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Amen.
Well, just at the outset, uh, as you're turning to Psalm 51, uh, at the outset, I just want to uh, say, uh, give a thank you to the pastor for allowing me to uh, preach a sermon tonight and then on Wednesday night. And I never take those things lightly. Uh, they're, it's very important on what, uh, what you're giving out from the pulpit. And uh, I've never uh, taken that lightly and just off the cuff kind of thing. It's, uh, it's extremely important, and I appreciate the pastor's confidence uh, in me enough to do that. And um, definitely want to continue to pray for uh, the pastor and Bethany and Chris and all the teens that are moving out. And be praying that not only safety travel, but that the Lord will touch the hearts of the teens wherever it needs to be touched, you know, whatever area. Um, and that it would, um, if they make decisions, that, that those things would s stay. A lot of times decisions are made in certain atmospheres, and, and then after weeks go by, they, they tend to drop off a little bit. But that's true of all of us. And so if we're not, <clears throat> excuse me, if we're not on the ball with it, uh, then we'll find ourselves in the same position that we were. And it kind of leads me into what we're going to be speaking about tonight. And um, how many of you have seen that commercial where there's an there's a older woman laying at the bottom of the stairs and, and she punches her little, or she says, I've fallen, I can't get up, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, well, that's what I, I want to talk to you tonight about, about uh, just the title, I've fallen and I, and I can't get up. And, but now I'm talking not physically, but I'm talking about spiritually. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. And so I want you to look at, um, at this moment, uh, I want you to look at uh, Psalm 51, and I want to read just verses 10 and verse 17 uh, as the text. I'll go through the rest of the verses, but for the sake of time, verse 10 and verse 17. Verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then over in verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Um, so those were the two main verses I wanted to read out of this chapter as our text, although we're going to look at everything. Um, and we're going to be talking about is it possible for a Christian who is so far removed from God, and believe me, a Christian can get themselves in a position where they get so far removed from God uh, that, that they aren't even thinking anymore about the Lord. Um, it doesn't, now I'm glad, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm really glad that uh, a person's salvation is not up to me and it's up to the Lord. You know, he holds the books. But as a Christian, there are times in my life, and in your life perhaps, where we find ourselves backsliding. Uh, and why do we use the term backsliding? Well, because we're not forward sliding, right? <laughs> you know, and in the Christian's life, nothing is stagnant. Nothing is stagnant. Your, your spiritual life and my spiritual life is not stagnant. You're, we're either moving forward or we're sliding backwards. And so, is it possible for a Christian who is so far from God to be restored again into fellowship with God? And we're not talking about salvation. That's why I use the word fellowship. Uh, is it possible for him to re get restored back into a, a good fellowship with God? Well, we know the answer, obvious, obviously, is yes, it is possible. All things are what? Possible with God, right? And all of that is dependent upon him as well. And uh, as the title of this uh, psalm indicates, David, I mean, if you have a, if you have a Bible that lists where, where this psalm came from, who wrote it, and what the circumstances were, was, you find that David had already committed adultery, uh, he had committed murder, and he's in a, it's, it, at this time now, I forget exactly how many years, maybe a couple years had gone by, but Nathan the prophet comes and confronts David and gives him that, and that's in what, 2 Samuel chapter 12, and he gives, he gives David a scenario. He tells him about an illustration about a man comes, you know, and, and uh, he has a visitor, and what does he do? The man goes and takes the one sheep 
that the other guy has, his neighbor, which is really just a pet. It's not something that he want, would slaughter and eat. But the man takes that and, uh, and gives it to his guest. And David becomes irate with that. Uh, he's, he's extremely mad over that. He goes, you tell me who it is, and we'll take care of that. And Nathan, point, you know, as, uh, as I've heard many preachers say, pointed his long finger in David's face and said, Thou art the man. And so this is the situation now that we find David in. And he's now re he's repenting of his sin. He's, he's getting back into business with the Lord because he wants to restore the fellowship that he once had. And by the way, uh, even after all that, God calls David what? A man after his own heart, right? A man after his own heart. And uh, so within that statement right there, and then with the circumstances of David, I know that it's possible for us to be restored into good fellowship and to move on in our Christian life like we should, if, if that was possible for David. Now, uh, David, at the time of that sin, he had obviously forgotten Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, it says, Behold, uh, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will what? Find you out. And uh, we as Christians need to remember that there is a principle in Numbers that is definitely not gone away. That our sin will find us out. And we need to be careful about how we live. We need to live a righteous and holy life with the Lord uh, helping us to do so, the Holy Spirit. And uh, we don't want to forget that God knows all things. Um, what, did, uh, what did David, I think, was it wrote? Or no, I'm sorry, Samson. Uh, I think that wrote, um, not Samson. No, I forgot, forgot who it was. Uh, Solomon, excuse me. Yeah, um, but wrote that, you know, uh, if you ascend into heaven, God's there. If you descend into hell, God's there. Uh, if I hide, God still knows where I'm at. In other words, there's nowhere we can go and that God doesn't know where we're at. Uh, I used to think that, uh, that I could get away. When I joined the army, my whole purpose of joining the army was to get away from people. And, uh, and I, and Honestly, and you've heard this before, I mean, I won't go into all of it, but you, you've heard it before, that I told the Lord on the corner of Bob Jones University in 1979, uh, after I told the dean, I said, I'm leave, leaving, and, uh, and I was waiting for a ride, and I had all my stuff sitting on the corner of the university, and I looked up to God, and I said, God, you show me what it's like not to be a Christian, and I'll decide. I mean, literally. Uh, and that was, and, and you know, you know what God did? He said, okay, I'll let you, I'll let you go that route. And he did. Uh, and of course, there are consequences with all that too. Uh, so I don't, I don't uh, recommend anybody saying that. Um, now, I want us to look at verses one through six. Now we're talking about being restored into sweet fellowship with the Lord. And uh, I'm, I'm just saying that there's, you're going to find a time uh, in your Christian growth, in your Christian life, where uh, you, you might just you, know, you might find a time where you just feel like you know I feel like I, I don't. Number one, my prayers aren't going past the roof. Number two, I don't even feel like praying. Number three, I don't even feel like reading the scripture. I don't even want to open up the scripture. And I certainly don't want to be around God's people because if I come into church, I feel guilty. Anybody ever been there? You don't have to raise your hand. And if we're not careful, we can find our, ourselves in that spot very quickly. Or we might act as though we're not in that spot and everything's fine. We come to church, you know, smile, sing the songs, do all that. Knowing full well that in our heart, our heart is hardened and that we're not right with the Lord. But for the sake of embarrassment or anything else, we just act as though everything's okay and we leave and go out and just keep doing that. And I can tell you by experience, let me just ask the question, if we're like that, what is it going to take 
to get us back where we're supposed to be? What would it take? I know what it took for me. All right, so let's look at the first thing. In verses 1 through 6, if we're going to have a right fellowship with the Lord, the first thing is there's a confession of sin. That has to happen. That has to be first. Look at verses 1 through 6 with me. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be uh, clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. First thing there has to be is, is confession. Now, uh, the con first of all, the confession, or in confession, there is an appeal to God's mercy, and you find that in verses 1 and 2, and also in verse 9. And so look what he says, the very first phrase, Have mercy upon me, O God. And he doesn't stop there. He says, According to thy loving kindness. Now, when we ask for God's mercy for something of this nature, we, we need to ask according to your loving kindness. According to your loving kindness. Have mercy on me. Look at verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my, my iniquities. What is he saying? He's saying, Lord, please have mercy on me. He's not trying to get away or trying to bargain with God. He's not trying to excuse what he did. As a matter of fact, what does he say? Have mercy upon me, O my God, according to thy loving kindness. And then down here he says, blot out my transgressions, mine. In today's society, there's a lot of um, shifting of blame. You ever notice that? Shifting of blame. Now, that's not my fault. You know, I was raised in a certain way. I've, I've had people, uh, Christians, who have, who have said to me, well, pastor, at the time I was pastoring, he said, pastor, I can't do this, I can't do that. I mean, I was raised, how am I going to, how can I, I even possibly do this or that, whatever it might have been. And um, that's the trend today, especially. I got, I've, I've got all this I've got to do, so I possibly can't do what you're asking. Now, he's asking, David's asking to have mercy from God, and not in a general sense, which the world depends on. What does God's mercy do? It rains upon the just and the unjust, doesn't it? God's mercy is upon the world. If it wasn't, there would be nothing here. Okay, think about that a little bit. And it's not based on his own merits. David didn't go to God and start uh, saying, well, Lord, you know, I, I know I messed up, but I've been a pretty good person. I talk to people and, you know, and I encourage people to do right. And, and, you know, and I've done this and I've done that. David wasn't asking for God's mercy based on his good merits. Instead, he's asking mercy based on the everlasting and unchanging love of Christ. He's saying, Lord, have mercy on me. In your righteousness, in your holiness, have mercy on me. And in confession of our sin, we must appeal to God's loving mercy, asking him to, be, to blot out our sins. Listen, we appeal to God's love. 1 John 1, 9 says what? If we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just. To do what? Forgive us our sin and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by the way, who's that written to? I mean, I know it applies to unsaved, but it's written to us, right? If we're faithful, God, I mean, if we confess, God is faithful. Why? Because my faithfulness is no good. Uh, do you ever get angry at yourself for not being as faithful as you should be? I mean, I, I do as well, I, I, just about all the time. And I'll be like, man, you know, why can't you get it through your thick skull that you're not being faithful like you're supposed to be, you know? Uh, and then I have to go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I'm, I, it's me again, you know? <laughs> so uh, 
he appealed to God's mercy. Now, the measure of David's hope consists of a thorough washing. Look at verse 2. He says what? Wash me a little. He says, wash me how? Thoroughly. From what? Mine iniquity. And while you're washing, not only wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, but do something else. What does he say? Cleanse me from my sin. So what is he saying? David's saying, Lord, wash me from my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly. And then cleanse me from my sin. I kind of relate it to when you're growing up. You know what um, mom said? What? Go get a bath or a shower, whatever the case may be, right? Your mom never said that? You can speak to me. Don't be so quiet now. Yeah, our moms will say, go get a shower, go get a bath, right? And as a kid, you know, three minutes later, I'm walking back out of the bathroom, you know. And, uh, and she goes, did you take a shower? Yeah, did you, did you actually get under the water and use the, you know, and then she, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. She goes, come here. And what was she getting ready to check? Right behind the ears, you know. That's where, you know, every kid forgets. And uh, she'd check behind the ears, and then she'd look at me. She'd go, get back in there. And this time, you soap. All right? And, um, and then she'd check again. I knew she'd check again after that. And so uh, uh, I would go in there, and I would not only be washed thoroughly, but I would be cleansed from the dirt behind my ears and under my fingernails as best I could because of what? Because I knew there was an inspection coming, you know, after I got out. David's saying, God, please wash me completely, thoroughly. Don't, don't let anything go by. Wash me thoroughly and cleanse me. What is he saying? He's saying, get that out of my life. Forgive me. Get that out of my life is what he's asking God to do. Wash me. For, that's forgiveness. And cleanse me. Get it away from me so that I don't ever do it again. Uh, you know, a lot of times we Christians, we, we, we come and we ask the Lord to forgive us for something. And a week later, we're right back doing it again, asking the Lord to forgive us. Now, I know that there are sins that's hard sometimes. They got a hold of us, right? Uh, we, sometimes the sins that we have from our unsaved world come, comes in there, and they're not always so easy. Uh, everybody in this auditorium and everybody listening live stream, I'm telling you, if you're a Christian, you've got a weakness. You've got a spiritual weakness. And the strong Christian is the one that knows what it is and guards against it. And tries not to let that take them over. All right, so uh, David's saying, wash me again and again. He's saying to multiply the washings because of his sin is so deeply stained. Uh, he uses three words to describe, to describe his sinfulness. He uses the word transgression, iniquity, and sin there. If you look um, in verses 1 and 2. Now, all of these are rebellion against God. All of, those, all of those things are rebellion against God. 1 John 1, 7 reminds us that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But what is the key there? Having the fellowship with the Lord, there's a key piece of Scripture there. It's at the very first phrase. What does it say? If we walk in the light as He is in the light. Do you remember where uh, in the New Testament where the Lord said, Be ye holy, for I am holy? I've, had, I've actually had Christians tell me, said, Well, that's impossible. Then that makes God a liar. You realize that? If it's impossible, then God's a liar. All right, uh, so David is saying, cleanse me. 
All right? Now, in confessing our sin, not only is there an appeal to God, verses 1 and 2, but there is also, uh, there's also going to be uh, an acknowledgement of sin. An acknowledgement. Now, in today's world, again, I, just, I go back to this. We just, we, we love to shift blame and not take responsibility. You see it all, all over the place, don't you? Not necessarily in a spiritual context, but in other contexts. Oh, that wasn't, that wasn't me. And it goes back to where? Where did all that originate? Adam and Eve, you know. It goes right back all to that. And uh, now in verses 3 through 6, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. What's David saying? He's saying, I take responsibility. It's my fault. Nobody forced me to sin against uh, you, God. It was me. It was my own lust. And by the way, what is the, the book of James tells us that uh, when we look on something and we're enticed by that, and then we give into that with the lust and all of that, that that's what causes the sin. We go on to sin. All right? And so um, in so doing, when he, when he, in verse 4, as a matter of fact, he acknowledged that it wasn't him against thee. Look what he says. Thee, he's talking about God, thee only have I sinned. I didn't sin against this person. I, didn't, I, I sinned against you, God. Now, that's another point. Not only we need to acknowledge that it's our sin, that we sinned, that I messed up. It wasn't anybody else's fault. It was me. And it was to God. I sinned against God. Uh, he said, I've done this evil in thy sight. Do you look at your sin as being evil? Sometimes I, you know, sometimes I wonder if, if, if I'm looking at my sin as being evil. Because we like to put labels. Our, our society likes to put different labels, fancy labels. You know, it's not a drunkard. It's an alcohol problem or, you know, alcoholism. But don't call them a drunkard, right? Uh, these commercials that are on here, on, on, uh, there's they're something else. You know, there's more. Well, I won't even go into the details, but there's more commercials now that, that try to powder puff, is the only thing I can say, the sins. I mean, it's just unbelievable. We'll just make it all nice and fluffy so that it's not so bad. David said, um, as he's confessing and acknowledging sin in Psalm 38, verse 18, he says, For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. When's the last time we were sorry for our sin? And sorry that we sinned against God. David said, I will declare mine iniquity. Who's he going to declare it to? He's going to declare it to God. And if, if he sinned against someone else, he needs to declare it to them too. Verses 5 and 6 show uh, the extent uh, of a truly sorrowful person. Look at verse 5 and 6. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Now, that doesn't mean his mother sinned when, when he, uh, um, and then conceived David. But that's talking about original sin. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward bar parts. What does he mean? Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. God desires truth in our heart to Him. He wants us to declare to Him the truth, not a lie. We can't lie to God. What, who are we trying to kid? And uh, he goes on in verse 6, And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Well, the wisdom's coming for us, comes from God's Word. And as I read and study God's Word, I am applying that, the Holy Spirit applies that, and if I find something or the Holy Spirit reveals something to me, then what? I declare it unto God. Um, Adam Clark wrote this about these verses. A genuine penitent 
will hide nothing of his state. He sees and bewails not only the acts of sin which he has committed, but the disposition that led to those acts. He deplores not only the transgression, but the carnal mind which is enmity against God. The light that shines into his soul shows him the very source whence uh, transgression proceeds. He sees his fallen nature as well as his sinful life. He asks pardon for his transgression, and he asks washing and cleansing for his inward defilements. Now to go from being a fallen Christian to a Christian after God's own heart, which David was, then not only is there a confession of sin, which is the very first thing, but then there is also the cleansing of Uh, that there is a removal of sin. In cleansing, there is a removal of sin. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, in cleansing, there is a removal of the sin, as we just mentioned. Now, in that verse, David alludes to the use of the cleansing of a leper. And what would happen was, if a leper was cleansed of his leprosy, he had to go through something in order to be welcomed back into the community, especially into the uh, temple. And uh, the priest would take two clean birds uh, um, and then some cedar wood, make an altar, scarlet and hyssop. And one of the birds he, the priest would kill and drain the blood. And the living bird would be, uh, the living bird and the scarlet, the cedar and the hyssop, all of that was dipped into the blood of the bird that had just been slain. And, uh, and then sprinkled over top of the head and all over the leper. And uh, that would uh, um, give him the rite of ceremony there that he had been truly cleansed. Now, there were some other things that went before that. The priest would have to check the leper to be sure that there was no lep- leprosy still there. Now, in doing this, what David is saying is he's requesting that the Lord to make a sin offering for him and to show to the people that, uh, uh, that, he had, uh, that God had accepted him and cleansed him from his sin. So David is saying, use, using the words hyssop and to be clean and to wash and all that, David's saying, God, God has cleansed me, and it is a show to all the people that he has been clean. He has been cleansed and washed and forgiven. Um, Now, when God forgives and cleanses, he also uh, accepts and restores the person. Uh, Now, not only does he do that, but then uh, he restores restores the joy of the person. In verse 8 and verse 12, David says, make me to hear what? Joy and gladness. Have you ever lost your joy? I have. I've lost it. And uh, before, uh, and David says, restore or make my, make me to hear joy. Where do we hear joy? We hear it right here in church. There's nothing like having people sing from their hearts in worship to the Lord and preparing themselves for the message that is to come. And sometimes, you know, let me ask you a question. Which one looks more like joy? If I'm singing, uh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you garments? Or, or is it, are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace? His joy, the joy of salvation. Of the Lord's salvation. David's requesting to hear the kind of the, the kind voice of God pronouncing his pardon. Happiness and all of that, all that comes with it. Acts chapter 9, verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing. What was he rejoicing? What was Philip rejoicing over? Do you know? Yeah, the fact that someone had been saved and baptized. 
And that God had, in his infinite wisdom, God took him from one place, put him in the desert. Here comes the eunuch. And God put, said, join yourself to that eunuch. The eunuch's up there reading the book of Isaiah. And uh, the eunuch says, hey, can you explain this to me? And what did Philip do? Started from the beginning and told him about Christ. And we know that somewhere in between there, the eunuch got saved because the eunuch says, well, hey, here's, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, what? Well, you got to know the Lord is your Savior. And they, then the Bible says that the both of them went down into the water and was baptized. And they came up and God took Philip somewhere else. And Philip went away rejoicing. I, I, it reminds me of the verse in Psalms that talks about he that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Are you rejoicing today? Where's your joy at today? Life is tough. I'm not trying to minimize it. Life is tough. But it doesn't, listen, you don't necessarily have to be happy. Circumstances do that. But nobody can rob our joy, regardless of circumstances. I can still be joyful. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a changed life involved. There's a new vision. John 9, 25, he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Do you know when my joy is restored unto me and I'm forgiven and I'm washed thoroughly and cleansed, do you know I have a new vision? All of a sudden, telling somebody about the Lord becomes more important to me. All of a sudden, people become more important than me. A new vision. Gives us a song in our souls. Psalm 40, verses 2 and 3. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. He shall put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it, and fear, fear what? You? No, fear God, and shall trust in the Lord. You ever have somebody come up to you and say, you know what? I don't know what it is about you, but you've got something that I need. When's the last time you were at work, maybe? And then a song just comes out. A good gospel song where you're giving praise to God. I was walking down the hall not too long ago and, at work. And I was humming a song to myself. And I passed a, one of the housekeepers. She was coming the other way. And she was singing a song. And I stopped her. I said, sing a little more. She sang a little more of that song. A joyful noise. And we talked a little bit, and now every time we see each other, she'll say, Amen. And I'll say, Praise the Lord. Then there's a renewing of the Spirit as well in verses 10 through 12. And I've got to hurry, but you can see in verses 10 through 12, we read verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now remember, this is when the Holy Spirit came and went, and David's saying, Lord, don't take the Holy Spirit from me. 
He says, don't cast me from your presence. And then in verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Listen, there are so many Christians today who don't have the joy of their salvation. Why is that? It's because we've allowed the sinfulness and the evil of the world to infiltrate our lives. And it just snatches away the joy of our salvation. Aren't you glad that God saved you? We ought to praise him. Wait a minute. I only, I, wait, hold on a second. Aren't you glad that God saved you? Yeah, that's more like it. Every morning we ought to get up. Every day we ought to be saying sometime during the day, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me eternal life and giving me the Holy Spirit to help me walk as you would walk and to be more like you. We ought to be thanking the Lord. And we get so big. Listen, this world is not our home. Peter tells us we're alien. We're just passing through this world. Our home, we have a heavenly home. And we're headed there. We ought to have our eyes focused on our goal, and that is heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, and being with Him and, and, not, and just excited for the fact that we'll be there one day and become more like Him, a renewing of the Spirit. And then there's um, the third thing, commitment to service. And so there's confession of sin. How do we get right with the Lord? How do we go on and renew that joy and renew our spiritual life and fellowship with the Lord? A confession of sin, verses 1 through 6. A cleansing of sin in verses 7 through 12. But then there's a commitment to service in verses 13 through 17 that he gives. Look at verse 13. Then, then, now that word means after something. What is it? After these things are restored, after God has forgiven me of my sin and God has cleansed me uh, thoroughly and washed me thoroughly and cleansed me of my sin and restored my joy. He says in verse 13, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Do you know the, the, that you're able to witness far better when you have a sweet fellowship with the Lord? And sinners shall be converted unto thee. <clears throat> What's he saying? It's a commitment to service. He says, I'll get involved. I'll get involved with my life of service to you, Lord. And then he says also in verses 14 and 15, Deliver me from blood uh, guiltiness, O God. Thou, God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Amen to that. We begin to do what? We begin to open our mouth and tell people about the Lord. And then in verses 16 and 17, service involves our spirit as well. Look at verse 16. For thou des desirest not sacrifice, else I, I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Now get this. God's looking for a He don't want us to come to Him in pride. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You remember Cain and Abel? We heard about it just not too long ago. Pastor mentioned it. Cain came to, uh, came to sacrifice, bringing his own goods, right? Abel came properly. And then what happened? That was out of, Cain's was out of pride. And then what happened? Cain killed Abel. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Maybe one, maybe one of the reasons why we can't ever get past something is because we really don't have a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. When was the last time we were at the altar and just weeping over our sin? And he says in verse 18, Do good in thy good pleasure 
um, unto Zion, he's talking about now Jerusalem, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. And in verse 19, after these things, he says in verse 19, Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. And he's, he's alluding to what Jerusalem will do. But look at the very first part of verse 19. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of what? Righteousness. What's the whole goal? The goal is to be righteous. The goal is to be in sweet fellowship with the Lord. The goal is to bring others to Christ. The goal is to have the kind of a, a spirit that is with the Lord and that people can see Jesus through you. We all have a testimony, every one of us. How's your testimony? Only you and the Lord can answer that. But I sure hope it's one of a contrite spirit, a broken heart over our sin, and a, and, and a prayerful worship to the Lord to be as Christ is. Each day, I know we mess up, believe me. But boy, when we keep a short, a, a short sheet of what we messed up, as soon as the Holy Spirit says, hey, wrong, what should we do? Get it right with the Lord. Don't let things build up. Get it right with the Lord. I'm, I'm just telling you, you drive down the road and you see something, somebody, some bonehead do something, and you may say something, I don't know. Or you might think something. You might not say it out loud. You might think something. You know what we ought to do? And if it was wrong, what we thought or said, you know what we ought to be doing? Lord, what I just thought and said is wrong. Please forgive me for that. Why? Because I'm responsible for me. I'm not responsible for the person that's out there driving crazy. I'm responsible for me. And my thoughts and my speech and my life, the way I do things, I'm responsible. Nobody else is responsible for me. I'm responsible for me. And you are responsible for you. So I hope everything is in good fellowship with you and the Lord. If not, you can change that. You can change it. Just go to the Lord. Lord, please forgive me. I know he's forgiven us eternally. But you know, they, before you walked into the house of someone you were visiting back in the first century, and you may have just taken a bath, and you're going to walk into the house and visit someone, you know that they would, they, they would have a slave, a servant, wash your feet. Why? Because from your house to there, you got dirty. I know you're saved eternally with the Lord, right? But before we get home, there's a lot of dust on the feet. And that is removed by continuously, Lord, forgive me, keeping a, keeping a, a close watch on those things. Let's stand. Holly's going to play an invitation. If you, if you would like to come to the altar, I encourage you to do so. I know you can do that right at your seat as well. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Lord, I do pray that you would help me. Help me, Lord, to keep a, a, a check on these things. Help me to keep a clean slate. I, Lord, I desire sweet fellowship with you. And I desire to see people saved and on their way to heaven. My biggest desire 
is to please you. So I pray, Lord, that you would help me to always, always be diligent in asking your forgiveness if I mess up. It's no one else's responsibility, it's mine. And I thank you for that example in Psalm 51 that David did. In your name I pray, amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to let Miss Holly play a couple of verses. Appreciate you being here tonight. Don't forget Wednesday night service. And uh, as you go out of here, just it, it, you, it's going to be hot this week, so try to stay cool. But also try to stay cool. You know the devil's going to try you. He's going to try you this week. Just stay alert. Stay alert. And if you mess up, don't give up. If you mess up, don't give up. Keep on keeping on for the Lord. Right. Keep a clean slate. All right, Brother John, would you pray for us and uh, dismiss us, please? Amen. You dismissed.